So I am back from San Francisco and I've spent the last 24 hours frantically editing the video I released this morning on the Sony 24 millimeter G Master lens, which I think is outstanding. The purpose of that video was to show you guys, kind of give you my impressions having hands on for a day with that lens and show you some stills and some video footage of what the lens is capable of doing. But I wanted to do a second video to talk a little bit about lens design and where Sony in particular sits with this because I think there's some very significant things about this 24 millimeter lens that people aren't realizing. And I realize that lenses aren't as sexy as camera bodies. And you know, a lot of people, you know, when the rumors started up that it looks like Sony might have a 24 millimeter lens and you see people literally going, well, that's kind of a boring product. It's not for me. I'm really excited and I'm gonna tell you why in this video because I think particularly these last two lenses that Sony has released are very significant and I think they're very much a key to seeing where we're going to go in the future um, with optics design in a mirrorless system. And this is what's interesting. Now, when we go on these Sony press trips, um, there are events where we can talk to people who work with Sony and I had several opportunities to talk to Mark Weir, who is a friend of mine. Uh, Mark is great, he's very funny and he's extremely smart and it's really interesting to talk to him about the Sony camera system since that's his department that's he works with all this stuff and he also understands it and we were talking about this whole notion of the mirrorless camera being more than designing a camera without a mirror box in it you have a full data readout and what are you doing with that data and how does this marry in with this whole science of optics and more traditional types of photography and how does this take cameras down the line into the future and one of the things that's very interesting that Mark had said is he said you know we are in a day right now where the camera is almost fully solid state and he's right and you have autofocus systems that early on in the 80s when they were developed they were rotational and so they would turn like you know when you turn to manual focus and it's not a very efficient way for a lens to autofocus it's not a very efficient way for motors to work and we're in this time now where autofocus is much faster and so these are being replaced with these direct linear motors so basically it just slides back and forth electronically and it allows for faster quieter and more accurate autofocus and when you pair this up with something like the Sony a9 which is capable of shooting 20 frames a second it's also capable of autofocusing and changing autofocus 60 times a second, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Now, the last two lenses that Sony has designed and released to us, the 400 millimeter f2.8. I was lucky enough to go to New Jersey and get to use that lens. I did a video on that. You can watch it somewhere up here. Um, that's an amazing lens, and it is also an astronomically expensive lens, and it's also a very special use lens. And none of these things are bad, but it's not the kind of lens that, you know, unless you're a working sports photographer, it's probably not something you're gonna just spend all that money on to have sit on the desk. I mean, we're talking like, I can't remember exactly, but it's more than $10,000. It's an expensive lens. This 24 millimeter is got the same technology, but it's not an expensive lens in comparison. And it is something that people would use day to day. And so I think there's a big difference uh, there, but also, you know, the 400 millimeter, that was the right lens to do for Sony because it communicates, hey, this camera can do sports photography. And when you're talking about why would you want to adjust your focus 60 times a second, well, that's a really easy application to see that in. But that technology is gonna be on G Master lenses and other lenses moving forward. And I think that's really important to note. It's that direct drive focus. And even if you're not not photographing at 20 frames a second. Let's say you're doing photojournalism or you're just doing street photography or whatever it is that you like to do. And if you know how to set up the autofocus and manipulate, even if you're waiting for that decisive moment, if you're using it correctly, chances are you're gonna be in focus more times than you're not. So the technology is somewhat becoming invisible and it's allowing you to do your thing as a photographer and be creative and let that be out of the way. So I think it's a really interesting thing to look at. And when we were got to talking about that, that's when I realized that the A9, there's potential way beyond sports photography or high speed frame rate photography with that camera. And I think it's really interesting to see. But Sony also, and they really don't toot their own horn very much on this, but I think it's fascinating. But what they're doing with optics is extremely interesting in these lenses as well. Now, optics is that sciencey thing where it starts going over people's heads and, you know, and I promise not to get too mathy on this. But I want to talk about some of the things that they're doing with these lenses. And when you look at just, you know, a brief history of lens design, you know, in the 1950s, that's when the two German companies, there were more, but the big two were Leica and Zeiss. And they really got to us to a point with lenses where we had perfected contrast and sharpness and how we perceive all these things in a lens as it pertains to film. It, in those days, the challenges weren't so much, um, well, they were designing lens and they got that done, but the biggest challenges were how do you produce that? So you've got this lens 
designed, you have a working model. How do we reproduce this at scale to sell it to people? And that's where it got really difficult. And today that's much different. We're in a very different place. I mean, we have the technology at scale to reproduce lenses with tolerances down to a sub micron level when you're talking about thickness and smoothness. And so like for instance, you know, we have elements that live within a lens and it's not uncommon to have a spherical elements within a lens. And Sony have this technology that they're using now called XA elements or extreme spherical elements. And so just to back up a little bit, this is what an spherical element does. Now a spherical lens element basically will gather light, but then there's some offset that can happen sometimes due to fraction variances in the lens and so it, it throws certain light rays out of focus with the focal plane and so the way that you perceive this in the image if you did not have any spherical element is sometimes sometimes high contrast starts to bloom a little bit and you perceive less sharpness that way and so typically and this is not unique to Sony but an aspherical element is used to correct that and typically a second aspherical element will be used to correct other distortions but that is pretty common in most most lenses that are of any quality these days. You will have at least one aspherical element. Now the extreme aspherical element, and this is what's really interesting, there's two things that it does. If you like to shoot a lens wide open to get that beautiful circular book of ball look thing, if you see little lights or something, the circular highlights, and they're perfectly round when you're wide open, sometimes you can see what we call onion skinning. So it has little circles within the circle. And if this is something that you're really into, sometimes that can be off-putting about the look of the bokeh. And so what's interesting is what you're seeing with those circles is those are slight imperfections in the surface of that aspherical element glass. So Sony used this element that is called an extreme aspherical, and these are very difficult to make. They're more expensive, and it is not a ground glass. It's actually molded, and there are only a couple companies in the world that actually do this, but the result is, is that you have a much smoother tolerance across the surface. So when you look at the bokeh balls, you don't see any onion skinning. There's a secondary thing that this corrects as well, and it's called sagittal flare. And basically what this means is like if you're into astrophotography and you're shooting at the sky and you have these little tiny points of light, their stars, right? And if you zoom in, if you have enough megapixels to see it, you zoom in, you're going to see this diagonal flare that comes out the sides. And that's called sagittal flare. There's a reason it's called that. I promised I wouldn't get too mathy. Just know that that's what we call it. Well, again, these XA elements supposedly correct that. Now, I did not get a chance to do any astrophotography with this lens. I literally had it for a day, two hours of which were at dark and I'm in a city, so not gonna happen. I would like to get another copy of this lens to do some further testing on, and it would be interesting to see. But theoretically, this is how it stacks up. Another thing that we're controlling now, if we're really dialing down into our bokeh stuff, is that you have, so you have an aperture and it's formed by a series of blades. And what happens is that looks circular when it's wide open, but when you start to stop down, it becomes geometrical. And you see this in those circular bokeh patterns. Now, what's interesting is typically any given lens does not perform at its peak wide open. When it's wide open, you're gonna see vignetting, the micro contrast hasn't come into play, and you want to stop the lens down just a little bit. In fact, every lens has kind of this peak zone where it's really performing at its best. More expensive lenses will have a bit bigger zone, but all lenses, you don't wanna do them wide open, but you typically between, let's say, f4 to maybe about f8 is really that sweet spot. And so if you like the bokeh look, but you don't want the vignetting, and even if you stop down to 2.8, those blades close in, you start to see a geometric pattern depending on how many blades you have on the iris or the aperture. And so the standard number with most companies like Nikon and Canon and Sigma, they're all nine except for Canon. Canon has eight blades. And so having 11 blades, which Sony has in this camera, is a really simple way of just being able to stop down to maybe f2.8 and the more you stop down depending on your distance and stuff you're probably going to lose a lot of that look anyway but being able to stop down just a little bit is really nice to have so it's really interesting to see that sony are doing things because you know since the 1950s there hasn't been a whole lot of innovation in terms of optics we've just gotten to this point where we've you know we've worked on coatings and we've worked on manufacturing techniques but the optics themselves and this is one thing that sony are starting to do with their lenses and it's going to be interesting to see how this works moving forward because my conversation with Mark, he was saying this is the direction we're going in. I, you know, the, the, the 400 millimeter lens was the first with kind of this type of technology that came with it. 
but that's a really specialized use lens. And now we're going to start seeing lenses that are released that are probably more practical for people to own and more standard for people to have in their arsenal. And I, I can't wait to see what they have. And I'm going to get a copy of the 24 millimeter as soon as I can, because I really want to do some testing with this. I also want to do some comparing and people have asked about how it compares to different lenses. One of my favorite lenses that I have used on Sony quite extensively is the Zeiss Batis 25. Absolutely love it. It actually measures out to like a 24.2. So it's very similar, except this is an f2 it's its widest aperture so i will compare those two another one people have asked a lot about is how does that compare to the fujifilm 16 millimeter 1.4 i don't think that's a really fair comparison because we're talking about aps-c versus full frame this is a 16 millimeter lens yes i know they have the same basic field of view when the you get your output file but it's a 16 millimeter lens that's designed to do the same thing so it's really it's hard to compare f1.4 on both lenses um I, I can talk about it. I mean, this one does have a closer focal distance, I mean, working focus distance than the 24 millimeter Sony. It's just kind of a different beast. And the other thing is it's not like you're going to be crossing systems with those lenses. So if you're a Fujifilm user, this is an amazing lens. I don't know that one is necessarily better than the other, other than the usual benefits of being full frame, which would be lens distortion and stuff like that, which actually Fuji control pretty well. So anyway, I will talk about that more when I get another lens in to, uh, to compare them with. But anyway, those are some of my thoughts on what Sony is doing now with, with the system as a whole. And lenses are a huge part of that and I see innovation coming from them that hopefully we'll see in other companies as well and whether it works or not I mean we'll find out the thing you have to remember is Fuji have been in this mirrorless system for five years now so they've had five years of ground to cover whereas Nikon and Canon have just jumped in so who knows they could do great this isn't a versus video I'm not putting it that way I'm just pointing out some of the things and and quite frankly there's some of the things that have drawn me to the Sony system all along and it's really great to all see them all coming together at this point if you guys have anything you would like to add please leave me a comment below I will do more on lenses depending on if that's actually interesting to you guys or not I don't want to be one of those things where we start getting into a bunch of heavy lens stuff and everybody fades out but I think it's important to understand how a lens works if you're a photographer you need to understand understand how it's going to perform and do what it is that you want to do. Anyway, that's all I got for today. I'll see you guys in the next video. Oh, go watch the old one, the, the old one, the old one, the old one I did this morning. Go watch the last video I did on the Sony 24 millimeter and you can see some samples and stuff in there. So anyway, I'll link that up here. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, later.